Hi, I've just been out for lunch with a friend. My friend and I have known each other for 24 years now. And we've worked together. We've been away on weekends together. And when I was diagnosed with my ADHD a couple of years ago, I had a conversation with her and she was really shocked because she said she had no idea. She would never have imagined. I didn't seem like somebody who had ADHD. And today we've been out for lunch and had a really good conversation about what that ADHD diagnosis kind of brought up for me and what it what it's meant in terms of kind of being able to talk openly about ADHD now that I understand it I couldn't have talked about it 20 years ago because I didn't even know what it was but I was able today I think to just give her a bit better understanding of how it impacts me and I thought as I've got half an hour on my hands I would sit here in the car and talk to you about my ADHD and how it impacts me in the hope that maybe if you're wondering if you have ADHD or if you're recently diagnosed or even if you're not and you're just curious, you maybe get a, a perspective about how ADHD impacts me. And it, ADHD isn't the same in everybody. Like any condition, um, that there are lots of factors that impact our behaviour and our attitudes and how we show up in the world and it's not just to do with our neurology it's not just to do with how we think it's also to do with our upbringing our sense of self our self-esteem how much confidence we were sort of given as as children how much love and affection we got as children you know there's so much that goes into it so I'm just going to share my experience I haven't got any notes the title is ADHD and me unedited <laughs> and that's exactly what it is it's ADHD and me and this will be minimal ed editing if I make any complete mess ups I'm not going to make you sit through those so there might be a small amount of editing but I'm not going to edit out all of my thoughts and thinking times and probably not even edit out the ums and the errs and I didn't want to script it because I didn't want to think that hard in advance about what I was going to say. So, you know, I will try and stay as unwaffly as possible. But I also want it to be authentic in that it's not been pre-planned. And I think just to, to get started, before I go anywhere, <laughs> welcome. If you've not been here before, if you're a brand new uh viewer and you've just found me, I'm Bev. I'm a 58-year-old woman with late diagnosed ADHD. I was diagnosed at 56. Um, I struggled through menopause, changed jobs at the age of 52, or rather left a job, a long-term career at the age of 52 to set up in business on my own. And I've been running my business now for six and a half years. And I, as I say, I found out I had ADHD just a couple of years ago. And there's something ironic about the fact that I'm sat here in the car talking at the moment because I have three quarters of an hour to wait before my granddaughter comes out of school and I'm collecting her from school today. I've been out this morning and had brunch with my friend and we had a mooch around the shops and bought things we don't need and had a lovely time uh, but I knew I had to get back for the school run and my time management isn't great so I have a tendency to turn up places far earlier than I need to because I'm so scared of being late and I think that's probably an ADHD trait as well. All of my adult life I've been that person who's never late for anything and I get very stressed if I think I'm going to be late but I also find that if I have if I know I have to be somewhere I find it very hard to plan other things in 
beforehand. I mean, I'm quite impressed that I was able to go out and spend the day with my friend. But even then, you know, I could have left half an hour later than I did and still got here with plenty of time. But I'm here three quarters of an hour early. I didn't go and do something else because I know I will probably lose track of time. Time blindness is a real thing. And I know I will lose track of time and I'll end up being late and then I'll be stressed and she'll be worried and uh, it's just not worth it. So a lot, a lot of my time is spent filling space with, I wouldn't say with nothing, because this is nothing, is it? At least I've got my camera with me and I can do this. But before the days of social media and mobile phones, I would be sitting kind of killing time wasting time because I was so worried about being late there's an irony irony I guess in the very fact that I'm doing that here while I'm recording so ADHD and me I think I always knew growing up that I was different but I wasn't different enough to be one of the different kids <laughs> you know you'll know the kids I mean the kids that um, when you're at school, just stand out as being massively different. I don't think I ever stood out as being different, but I always felt different. And I think it's because I'm going to just say this, and I, I, I'm, I don't mean to be offensive or to um, say the wrong thing, but I feel as if I was probably quite socially mature from quite a young age. So I knew how to fit in and I knew how to adapt a bit chameleon-like. And those are the kids who didn't fit in. I don't think they had that social maturity or social awareness. Now, with hindsight looking back and from what I've learned about it, I think they were probably more on the autistic scale rather than the ADHD scale although I think there's an awful lot of overlap and I'm learning that more but I think the social skills I developed very early and I think this is something I'm seeing that lots of girls are able to develop which is why I think so many girls even to this day have their ADHD missed uh, or diagnosed as something different because they know how to be a chameleon. They know how to be a good girl and sit quietly and get on with their work. So I don't think I ever looked different or stood out as different, but I definitely felt different. And one of the big things I think that I noticed quite early is that I was never very good with groups of friends. I always had a best friend uh, and it was always just the two of us. If there was ever more than two, I would really struggle. And I, I see that to this day. I don't have huge a huge friendship group. I have quite a lot of individual friends. And we see each other occasionally, like the, the friend today. We're, we've been very good friends for a long time. But I see her probably three or four times a year. I mean, it doesn't help that she lives in... Um, Saudi Arabia so so that's probably something to do with it but we don't call each other all the time and we don't you know we're not always communicating but I've never been comfortable in big groups of girls and or women or even big groups in general really I definitely am better sort of one-to-one -one. and one of the things we were talking about at lunchtime was that we when, when we worked together, we worked together in the uh, um, MOD, Ministry of Defence, for a long time. And we'd regularly have functions where a lot of the, the women that we worked with would get together and go for drinks, go for meals. And I've always thought I was extrovert um, up until recently. And I could never work out how, as an extrovert, I never felt comfortable in those group settings. I would always be either overcompensating. I, I don't know if this is how other people perceived it, but certainly how I perceived myself, I'd always be either overcompensating by trying to be too loud and too sociable 
um, often softened with alcohol, you know, that sort of Dutch courage to be sociable, um, or I'd withdraw. And I'd quite often, I think people used to perhaps think I was a bit stuck up or a little bit, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe they, I don't, I don't know, how can I know what other people think? But my perception was that people probably thought I was a bit stuck up. And it, it isn't that. I think it's just that I never fully felt like I fitted in. I don't do small talk very well. I'm not very good at chit chat. I don't watch a lot of the things that people watch on TV, sort of reality stuff. So when they were talking about all the, the gossipy stuff, magazine gossip and reality TV, I could never relate to that. I've, I think I've always been a little bit um different from I, I'm sure I'm not different from everybody but different from the groups that I was socializing with I didn't really really relate to what they were talking about so I just withdraw um and unless I felt I could relax because I had a, a good few drinks and and was able to kind of let go of some of those um some of that discomfort I would quite often leave early, be the one that kind of came home and, and didn't ever, I kind of went through the motions of going out with these groups, but never really enjoyed them. And it had nothing to do with the people. It wasn't that they weren't nice women or that they, you know, that there was anything wrong. It just, I never fitted in. And that that was something we were talking about today. And you know, I think she can, with hindsight, probably look back and see that now. The whole introvert extrovert thing is a little bit weird as well because I think I've all that that social adaptation, that social maturity that I talked about. I think my way around that in the past has been to carry the persona of an, an extrovert, and I realise I am so. Not I'm so not an extrovert. I'm very much an introvert. I love my own company. I love time on my own. I like to do things my way. I wouldn't say I'm a deep thinker in the sort of um, Myers-Briggs, ENFP, INFP kind of thing. I've always come out as an ENFP. But I think that that kind of talks about... Um, if I remember rightly, it's many, many years since I did a Myers-Briggs uh, assessment, but I'm sure their, their sort of introvert, extrovert is more the traditional, how we would expect introversion and extroversion, sort of loud and gregarious versus quiet and deep thinker. And I don't think that's my interpretation of introvert. For me, it's about where you get your energy, whether people drain your energy or boost your energy. And people definitely drain my energy. And one of the things that we were talking about at lunchtime as well was a friend of my friend who has quite severe ADHD and she's constantly talking and it's, you know, uh, like on overdrive talking and um, being overly verbose is, is quite a common trait of ADHD. And I don't think I have that. So I don't know whether there's a difference between introverts with ADHD and extroverts with ADHD. It was only something I thought about today. But I think if I'm an introverted ADHD, um, which probably means that I'm not that gregarious, talking a lot. I do talk a lot. I can talk a lot, but I don't have to talk a lot. And I think that might be the difference. Listening to what my friend was saying today about her friend, it's almost like this sort of compulsive need to talk constantly, whether that's her way of um, processing what's what's in her head, perhaps she has to vocalise it. I don't feel I have to do that. I can talk a lot. I do talk a lot, but I don't have to talk a lot. And I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I'm talking a lot now, aren't I? But there you go. But some of the other things about my ADHD that we were discussing was my lack of organisation. And we work together in an administrative role. And I know that I'm really bad at organising. I'm not very good at planning. I'm not very, I'm not very tidy. And I don't really think through things through sequentially. So if there are tasks to be done, I'm not 
always that good at putting those tasks into a logical order. And yet she said, well, I remember you being very, very good at your job. And yeah, your, your desk was a little bit untidy, but I wouldn't say, you, you know, she didn't notice that I had any difficulty with being organized. And when I was explaining to her that I can do it, I can be organized, I can, I'm not very good at planning, I do some, but we had structure, we had the plan there, if, if you know what I mean, we, we had a a process we had to follow. So I could do that because the process was there. I might have struggled a bit more if I'd had to create the process. But I was trying to explain to her that I can do it. But by the time I got home, I was exhausted. And it was like my mental load had reached its absolute limit. And I remember there were times when I was working full-time in a, in a paid job where if I'd had a busy week, I could do that busy week. But come the weekend, I was like a zombie. There was just nothing left in the tank at all. And I would get so annoyed and frustrated with myself. Oh, I get so annoyed and frustrated with myself because I feel like there was something fundamentally flawed about me that everybody else would come in on a Monday morning talking about all of the things they'd done over the weekend. And I'd have been barely able to get out my dressing gown and get off the sofa because I was just like paralyzed, like spent. And I came across this um, metaphor or analogy or whatever you want to call it about the spoons. I don't know if you're familiar with the analogy of the spoons that, you know, everybody gets uh, a set of theoretical spoons, a number of theoretical spoons every day. And every task, every everything we do throughout the day uses a little bit of our mental load and it costs us a spoon. I have never understood the, the spoons analogy. It doesn't make sense to me. But I do find that if I change spoons to money, it makes sense. So I was trying to explain to my friend that in my mind, I th see it as as a neurodivergent person versus a neurotypical person, which she is, it's like we both get a hundred pounds of mental currency every morning. When we wake up, we've had a sleep, assuming we've had a decent night's sleep, that's another story. But we wake up in the morning and we have a hundred pounds of mental currency put into our mental wallet. And throughout the day, we have to spend some of that mental currency using a, that sort of executive functioning part of our brain. And I was trying to explain to her that for a neurotypical person like her, getting up, going in the shower, washing her hair, brushing her teeth, doing her makeup, getting dressed, driving to work, there's a lot of mental load in doing that, but it possibly costs her a fiver from a mental wallet, you know, five pounds from a mental wallet, five dollars if you're in the States. Um, Whereas for me to do that same amount of simple tasks, you know, and there's nothing that ma majorly difficult about brushing your teeth, having a shower, washing your hair, etc., and getting on, getting to work on time, that probably cost me nearer 15, maybe even 20 pounds of my mental currency. Then we do a full day's work, depending on how stressful the day is. That might cost her another thirty pounds in her mental wallet, but I've probably spent sixty or seventy pounds getting through the day. And then we get home in the evening. We've had the drive home. We've got to see to the kids, make dinner, sort the you know the dishwasher out, sort the washing out, do whatever housework or whatever we need to do, ferry the kids to wherever they needed to be and back again. By the time the day is finished. She's spent her hundred pounds. She's ready for bed. She recharges. I'm probably already in debt. You know, I've if we've done the same thing that day, or this, you know, had the similar sort of um, tasks to do, I'm probably fifty quid in debt before I even start the next day. And by the end of a week, my mental wallet is so overdrawn. I'm done. You know, I am like in in, 
in huge debt. So in order to refill my wallet, I have to kind of let my brain catch up at the weekend. And nobody saw that side of me other than my husband, my family, you know, my kids, because I didn't want to be sharing with the rest of the world that come, a, come the weekend. I'm absolutely shocked. And it wasn't every weekend, you know, certain things take more of a load than others. And so I was trying to explain that to her. And I think she sort of understood that because she kept saying, but, you know, I didn't know, you would never have known that you had ADHD. And of course, you wouldn't because up until recently, most of us didn't really understand what ADHD was really like, especially not for women. Um, we, we've all been brought up with a stereotype of, you know, hyperactive boys being disruptive in class. And that's so far from, from me. I was also talking to her about some memories I had of school and how we moved, I moved to school when I was um, 11, sorry, 13. Most people go up to high school um, or secondary school at 11, juniors and seniors. But I moved at 13 because we had a weird sort of um, first, middle and high school uh, system. And when I moved up to the high school, I can't remember if I've ever talked about this on a video before. I might have done apologies if I'm repeating myself. When we moved up to high school, because I moved at 13, I'd had that sort of, I'd been, I'd been looked after by the teachers a lot. You know what it's like in sort of junior school, your, your, things are done for you. And then you get to senior school or high school, which for us in the UK, for me, it was 13 to 16. That was my high school. Suddenly you're on your own. And we had this weird two-weekly um, timetabling. So one week we'd have one timetable and then the next week we'd have a different timetable and then it would go back to week one, week two, week one, week two. And we had to write it all out in the front of an exercise book with week one and week two so we would always know where we were. But the, that was fundamentally problematic for me because A, I could never remember to take my exercise book so I never had it with me. And of course, it was way before the days of mobile phones where you would have it, you know, something to remind you. I am now, my Google Calendar on my phone is my second brain. And if I'd had it then, I think I'd have been all right. But it didn't. I had this exercise book that I could never remember to have with me. So I never knew where I was meant to be. Plus, I could never remember whether I was on week one or week two. And I used to get so stressed about the fact that I never knew where I was meant to be and which class I was meant to be in, that quite frankly, for most of my high school years, certainly not so much the first year, but sort of my um, 50, age 15, 16, those two really important formative years when you're about to take all of your O-levels as they were then, they're now GCSEs, but they were O-levels then, I played truant from school for so much of the time because it was easier to do nothing than it was to try and figure out where the fuck I was meant to be or where the heck I was meant to be. I might bleep that bit out. So it was so stressful. I was trying to explain to that, you know, there were times when I would just go home and I'd sit in my bedroom. I didn't have anything to do. I was bored, rigid, but at least I didn't have to try and be somewhere or remember things I didn't have to try and keep up I didn't have to try and fit in and I remember one day my dad coming home from work unexpectedly um, and I was in my bedroom and he he was home for about two and a half hours in the middle of the day I don't know why didn't ever ask him because I wasn't meant to be there and I had to stay in my bedroom silent so that he wouldn't come in and find that I'd played truant from school and I mean, looking back now, logically, why the hell wasn't I just in school <laughs> where I could at least have made a bit of noise? And I sat in that room for two and a half hours in silence, trying not to make a sound and not get caught. I mean, it's just bizarre, isn't it? 
So oh, anyway, I am rambling and we're nearly at 25 minutes. So I'm going to wrap this up. Um, there's uh, so many more things I could probably ramble on and talk about, but my, my granddaughter's going to be here in 15 minutes. Still have 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, time blindness. It's not good. Let me know um, in the comments if you're related to any of that or if I am really as wacky as I've often thought I am. And if you've got any questions about ADHD, obviously I can answer them from a what I've researched and learned point of view or just ask me about my experience and I'm happy to share, you know, how, how things are for me and my ADHD, which is really the only type of ADHD I understand because I live it every day. Um, but yeah, that's, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much for listening, if you're still here. And if you've got any value out of my long ramblings, please do think about giving this video a like and, you know, if you want to subscribe maybe and listen to more of my ramblings. They're not normally this rambly, I have to say. I'm normally more succinct than this. Uh, but if you want to get a little bit more of me, you know, you can hit the subscribe button. Until next time, take care.